I've got it all here and all set to go. And so we're going to go through Colossians 3, verse 1 through 11 today. And so uh, let's pray before we get started. Lord God, I pray that uh, as we uh, go through your word today, Lord, that we would not only just learn, Lord, but be able to apply it to our hearts and lives, Lord, because, uh, Lord, again, you are our teacher by your spirit. Uh, not words from me this morning, but words from you, Lord God. That's what we desire. And, Lord, I pray that we would take these words and just, uh, Lord, that you would impress them upon our hearts, Lord, that the life-changing words, Lord, that, that will cause us to mature and grow in you, Lord God. And that's our desire this morning. And we thank you for the time, and we thank you for the privilege. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, if you would stand for the reading of God's word. Colossians 3, and we're going to try to go through 1 through 11 this morning. Verse 3, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator." Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. You may be seated. All right, there's a lot here. Paul is again uh, uh, telling us things that we really should know already as believers but we need a refresher every now and then. We need to focus on these things. He says, set your hearts on things above, okay? Set your minds on things above. This, this is very important as we go through our daily living to keep our hearts and minds focused on him uh, because there's so many things that we get sidetracked with, uh, with our work and school and just daily lives. And so, He's making it a point here in this epistle in Colossians to remind the Colossian people. He says, you need to continually set your hearts and set your minds on things above. Heavenly things. Focus on Christ and him. Uh, so we're going to run through these verses this morning. He says, since then, in verse 1, you have been raised with Christ. So obviously you're born again. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So remember, we talked about this, this heart and mind thing a couple of weeks ago, how that's the core of the believer, this, especially in their culture back then, their their heart was the center of their being, okay? Well, that's connected with your mind. And he's saying, take that, the all of your being, everything that you're about, and make it focus on things above, okay? And it's so important, so important. Because if we get sidetracked and we start focusing on the things around us, like Peter did when he got out of the boat, he started looking at the waves instead of looking at focusing on Jesus. What happened? He started sinking. Well, that's exactly what will happen to us as well. We need to keep our focus straight. John Piper wrote, If you don't see the greatness of God, then all the things that money can buy become very enticing. If you can't see the sun, you will be impressed with a street light. 
If you never felt thunder and lightning, you'll be impressed with fireworks. And if you turn your back on the greatness and the majesty of God, you'll fall in love with a world of shadows and short-lived pleasures. Well, that's kind of the world that we live in right now is uh, a world that focuses on the material, that focuses on things, that focuses on money, that focuses on everything but what's really important. And as we go through this life on this, uh, on this earth, we see these things all around us all the time, and they're like landmines just waiting for us to step on them and say, oh, boy, here's another catastrophe. Here's another problem. Here's another crisis in my life. And it goes from one to the next to the next over and over and over again. And if we take our focus off the Lord and spiritual things and, and things of it that are in heaven, if we take our focus off of that and we focus on the stuff around us, it'll make us crazy. It will make us crazy. It'll drive you crazy. You'll be depressed all the time. So uh, Paul is saying, don't do that. Set your mind on things above. C.S. Lewis once wrote, If I find in myself a desire that this world can't fulfill, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Thank you, C.S. Lewis. Okay? That's our clue. We are pilgrims passing through. This is not our home. We talk about this all the time. This stop on this earth is temporary. We were created before. God created us before. But we were born into this life on this earth. But we're just here for a short time. It's almost like a, a, for those of you who fly, you get stuck in an airport for a little while. Is that your home? No, you're continuing on someplace else. Okay? That's the, that's the situation for the believer. We're continuing on from this life someplace else. Some of us are closer to the end of this life than others. And so it's a real reality. To, when, you're a little, when you're a little kid, you don't ever think about dying. You know, that's, no. You're, but as you age and get older, you realize nobody's making it out of here alive. We are all going to die. So my older brother that passed away four years ago, he used to tell me that all the time when I would start complaining to him about something. He would go, Nathan, this is not your home. You're just here for a little while. Well, he's gone. He was right. He was just here for a little while, and he's gone. But he used to tell me that all the time, and I know where he is now. Philippians 3.20 says, Our citizenship is in heaven. Y'all get that? Our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.4, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Did you get that? Christ, who is your life, okay? Your life came from him. Your life is wrapped up in him as a believer, and you are going to be with him in another day, okay? He's the center of everything. Our heart and mind needs to be centered on him. Our faith, our prayers, everything is wrapped up in him. He is our hope. He is our hope of glory. He's the center of everything because of who he is, the Lord. He gives us power to see it through all of our hard times by making us alive in Christ. Isn't that wonderful? We are alive in him. Apart from him, we've gone through this many times. We can't do nothing. We can't accomplish anything. Everything is in him. Everything. All our thoughts, our hearts, our minds need to be focused on him. I was looking at this uh, lesson material and the uh, writer talked about this Kaiser Family Foundation poll. They did a poll because of the pandemic that we're going through. It says that this pandemic has ne negatively affected the mental health of 56% of adults. So mentally, it's taken them down. 56%. It said in, in April, they allow text to this federal emergency mental health line, and their health line was 1,000% more calls than before. A thousand percent. So there's a lot of people, and I've talked to people who have quarantined themselves and things like that, and they said, well, I'm not ever doing that again. <laughs> I get it. I get it. You aren't made to be alone and isolated in the world. We're social beings, and because of this pandemic, it's caused a lot of people to be isolated, and their mind just goes to things that their mind doesn't need to go to. And because of that... Uh, 
It causes real problems. And in the, in the Christian life, everything spills over from the mind and from the heart, okay? What's in your heart comes out of your mouth. You've heard that before. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind. So the question is, and I've been probably 10 minutes building up to this, how do we keep our minds on Christ? How do we do it? What's the practical things that we can do to do that? Because we're all human and we know that we all get sidetracked into everything. And this uh, lesson writer that was doing this on Colossians says there's three things to keep in mind uh, to keep your mind on Christ. The first thing, always remember that we belong to a kingdom that is not of this earth. Remember when they were crucifying Jesus and they, and they asked him, so you're a king? Well, what are you a king of? And so, of course, he wouldn't answer. But we know where his kingdom lies, and that's where we're going because we're born again, okay? We have our identity in Jesus Christ. That's who we are. That's our focus. So we need to remember that we belong to a kingdom that is not of this earth, okay? This is a thing that we often forget. We get so caught up in the things of the world and everything around us that we forget the important things like this. Philippians 3.20. Philippians 3.20. Could somebody grab that water for me? Uh, says, our citizenship is in heaven. We just talked about this. Thank you, Derek. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so we live in the shadow of a returning Messiah. He is coming again. He's coming again. So we need to live with the outlook that we will see Jesus again. It may not be in this life, but we will see him, okay? First Peter 4, 7 says, The end of all things is near. What does that mean? Why did he say that? Because the end of all things is near. All right? He says, therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sin. So he's telling us how to interact with others too, with other believers. Um, because the heart is our mind. Uh, so it's crucial that we know this. In Matthew 22, verse 37, it says, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Okay? So what does that say about keeping your focus? Or where does that say to keep your focus? Keeping your mind on things above. Doesn't mean that we ignore all the people around us and, and just live like a hermit somewhere. Because, oh no, we can't, we can't do that. No, that's not what that means. We are to stay out there. We are in the world. We need to interact with people who are not believers, okay? How are they ever going to get saved? If we don't interact with others, how are they ever going to get saved? Okay, so we don't live on an island just ourselves, by ourselves. That's not what this scripture means. <clears throat> so we need, to, we need to interact with people around us. But at the same time, we need to keep our minds set on Christ uh, and things above. The second thing he says... Move away from the life of the past. Move away from the life of the past. How many of you who are saved and born again in this room had a different life in the past? Yeah, everybody. Why? Because you lived in that world and then you are born again and now it says you have a new life in Christ. And that's true. He changes you from the inside out. All right? And we live under a different set of guidelines. Remember last week we talked about the Old Testament law and how a lot of that didn't apply to the believer anymore. Okay? We have a new set of rules that applies to the believer. What are those sets of rules? Those boundaries are set by the Holy Spirit of God that indwells you. So when you're thinking about, oh, should I steal that item or whatever, that Holy Spirit of God says, no. That's not what you need to do. Don't, don't do that. If, you think, if you're thinking about uh, killing somebody or committing adultery or all of those things that are written out in the law, the Holy Spirit inside you tells you, no, you're not that. You're not, a, you're not that person. Don't be about that. 
We don't need that written law to tell us that it's wrong anymore as believers. We know it's wrong. How do we know? Because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. He sets the boundaries for us, okay? He's impressed it upon the heart of the believer. And so, even though our citizenship is in heaven, we're always in the battle here on earth, aren't we? It's constant. It never stops. Uh, Cheryl and I were talking about that here recently. We just like, man, we just go from one thing to the next to the next. It's constant. We just finish one big drama fest, and we go into the next big drama fest, you know, because we're not home yet. We're in this battle here on earth. So we shouldn't have a judgmental spirit toward others because of that. We've all got our battles to fight, every one of us in here. We all have our own battles. They're spiritual battles, yes, but we, we're involved in them, even though God fights them for us. We don't fight them in the flesh. We learned that, didn't we? Okay. I was just talking to a person this week that I hadn't seen in a while, and this person was talking about, oh, man, their family is so messed up. And I was listening and everything, and then I go, you know what? My family is so messed up. I said, that's the world that we live in. That is the world that we live in. I came to the conclusion that there is no perfect family, no picture-perfect family. I don't care what they write on face, or whatever it is, face, fake book is what I call it, right on fake book, uh, because have you seen... <laughs> I know you have. I don't want to get too sidetracked, but, you know, people sitting in restaurants and stuff that are taking pictures of their double meat and cheese hamburger and posting it on Facebook, you know, it's like, come on, get a life, you know? Nobody wants to see all that, and those, well, I'm not even going to go there. So, but the Lord does not want us to quit in this Christian struggle that we're in. We're not to quit. We're not to take steps backwards in the battle because who fights our battles for us? He does. The Lord does, okay? Uh, so we're not to take steps back. We're to keep trusting him and going forward with him. Uh, God's not pleased if we take steps back. He, he still loves you, but he's not pleased, okay? So we need to be moving away from our past life of sin and devoting ourselves to following Christ. Leave the old self behind. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitudes of your mind. Did you get that? To be made new in the attitude of your mind and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So, he says we can do this making our, making our attitudes of the mind new. Think about it. Does it sound like you might have a little bit, con little bit of control over what your mind is thinking? Yes, absolutely. In verse 5 it says, Put to death. Therefore, he's telling you to do this. Put to death, therefore, what belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. So he's, Paul is telling us to put this stuff to death. So this is something that we can do in him. These are sins of the flesh. We don't have to be a part of them, okay? He names five. Sexual immorality. Everybody knows what that is. And there's every variation of sexual immorality. There's a huge uh, laundry list. Proverbs 6, verse 27 says, Can a man scoop a flame into his lap and not have his clothes catch on fire? What does that mean? What does that mean? It means if you're an alcoholic, it's not a great idea to hang out in the bar. Okay? All right? If you surf porn sites... If you're prone to sexual immorality, it's not a great idea to surf porn sites, okay? If you're, if you're a drug addict, it's not a great idea to hang out with your drug buddies. Why? Because if you scoop this flame into your lap, your clothes are going to catch on fire. That's what Proverbs is saying. So leave it behind. You're a new creature in Christ. 
Leave it behind. All right. Impurity. The next thing he talks about is uh, impurity, which is embracing lurid imaginations. That's what it is. Leave it behind. You're a new creature in Christ, okay? What about lust? The emotion that leads to sexual excesses. That's lust. Leave it behind. You are a new creature in Christ. What about evil desires? Wicked, self-serving desires. Leave it behind. You're a new creature in Christ. We can do these things. We can leave it behind. What about evil desires? We just said that. What about greed? The desire to possess what belongs to somebody else. Is that good? No. No, leave it behind. You're a new creature in Christ. We've got to leave all this stuff behind. Colossians 3, 7 says, You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. It sounds just like past tense, doesn't it? In the life you once lived. That was our old redeem, unredeemed selves. Paul's famous for lists, isn't he? He's always giving us a list of something. But we just had a list of five here. Things that he wants us to invo- avoid. Things that he wants us to leave behind. But the problem is, and you guys know this because you're humans. If we're involved in any of that stuff, we can rationalize anything, can't we? We can rationalize it away. We can rationalize away any sin, okay, no matter what it is. Uh, I made a little list just as an example because these are true things, uh, and it's true. We can rationalize. It says, the list says, I may be a porn addict, but at least I pay my child support, unlike my neighbor Bill, okay, rationalizing it away. I can stop drinking any time I want. I just don't want to. I enjoy it too much. Okay? How about rationalization number three? If my wife wasn't yelling at me all the time, I wouldn't need to do drugs. It's her fault. Number four. I may be a chainsaw serial killer, but I don't mess with little kids. Okay? That's the human condition. That's who we are. We can rationalize away anything. But we, the, Paul's saying, don't do that. Just stay away from that stuff. Don't try to rationalize it away. And in Colossians 3, verse 8 and 9, as we move on here, uh, he says to move away from these sins of the heart. He says in verse 8, but now you must also rid yourselves Of all such things as these. There he is with another list. Rid yourself of anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other. That's a big deal. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices. So Paul's given us another list here. And he starts out with anger. He says, Rid yourselves of these things. Is it, let, me, let me back up. Is it okay to get angry? Well, sure it is. In righteous anger, there's a big difference. All right? People are going to get angry. Every one of you are going to get angry at some time or another. Some, some of us get angry really quick. Some of us have a slow burn kind of anger. But it's still angry. Okay? When Jesus got angry, what was he doing? He was driving the money changers out of the temple, wasn't he? Was he angry? You bet he was. Was it righteous anger? Yes. So I just want to clarify that. All right. Then he goes on to say rage, malice, slander, filthy language. None of these things characterize the new life of the believer, do they? None of them. These are personality traits, a lot of them. Uh, What do they do? What negative effect do they have on you? Well, first, they ruin your testimony. If you walk around and you're that guy, you don't have a testimony. Nobody wants to hear about your Jesus if you're living that kind of a life, okay? Uh, And they kill any chance of any healthy relationships going forward. How many of you know or used to know people who live this way, that slander people all the time, that lie? What kind of relationship can they have with you? No, no. I, I I would make their acquaintance for about, 10 seconds before I realized who they were and then I got to go watch my hair grow or something, you know, see you later, you know, well, in my case, that takes a while, but anyway, so, uh, 
Put your mind on things above and move away from this life of the past. Replace old ways with new ways. I like that. I always like something new. Let's replace the old self with the new self because that's who we are. In Colossians 3, verses 10 and 11. Verse 10 says, I have put on the new self. All right, we're believers. We know where we're going. Which is being renewed in knowledge and in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So all believers are one in Christ. And we're all, we, as a believer, we put on the new self. So we don't want to go back. We never want to backtrack. This new self, it says, is in the image of our creator. Isn't that interesting? William Barclay said, one of the great effects of Christianity is that it destroys the barriers which divide. Think about that. T.K. Abbott points out how this passage that we just read shows the barriers that, are, that Christianity destroyed. The first thing he says is, it destroys the barriers which come from birth and nationality. He's, basically, it doesn't matter whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, that all nations will gather at the table of the Lord. All nations. So it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. It's whether or not you are a believer and that you were born again. The second thing he says, it destroys the barriers which come from ceremonial and ritual, which is circumcised or uncircumcised, because all become one in Christ. So it doesn't matter if you're of the circumcised group or the uncircumcised group. Together, as under the umbrella of Christ, as a believer, we all become one. doesn't matter. Okay, the third thing he says, it destroys the barriers between cultured and uncultured. So you can have the greatest scholar, the smartest guy in the world, in the same, in the, in with the, the least educated in the world, that person, and they can sit in perfect fellowship in Christ. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? They're both the same in Christ. There's no, that, that barrier is down. And the fourth thing he says, it destroys the barrier between class and class. So the slave is the same as the free man. They're the same under the umbrella of Christ. Okay. The slave might still be a slave and the free man might still be a, a, a free man. But they're the same person in Christ's eyes. Okay. They're the same person. In the presence of God, they will be identical. Okay. There's no social distinctions there. They become irrelevant. So, in conclusion, I know y'all are waiting for this. How do we keep Christ in the center of our mind? How do we do it? Well, the first practical thing is make that choice daily to pray for it and seek God's help with it. Pray. Talk to God about it. All right? That'll, it, if you want to keep him the center of your mind, wouldn't it be a great idea to talk to him? Yeah. Yeah. So make that choice daily to pray. Seek him out. Philippians 4, verse 6 through 8 says, The peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So the second thing is make the choice to trust him. Trust that God can do this, that, can actually, that he can actually create you into a new being to put the old self behind. Make the choice to trust that he has done that, that he has created you to be a new creature in him, okay? Do not, it's in Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. So if you seek his will and all that you do, he will show you which path to take because our thinking and our understanding, according to this verse, it says don't depend on your own understanding. So that tells me that our own understanding or our own way of thinking can be flawed. Okay? So we could be making a mistake. So he says don't depend on that. Depend on him and his ways. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. I know that's hard for us sometimes because we want to 
go things, do things our way. Think about things our way. Understand things like we think that they are. But we could have a flawed perception of, of reality, of the world, of anything, of ourselves. So the third thing is make a choice to listen. Listen to God. John 8 verse 32 says, And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Isn't that a wonderful verse? How do we know the truth? We are taught the truth by God's Holy Spirit. What else? We have the Word, the Word of God as our teacher. We have two things here, two things that we can know the truth. And he says, and you will know the truth. That's what the verse says. You will know what the truth is, okay? And the truth will set you free. Fourth thing, make the choice to think about the best things. Here again, this is control of your mind and what you think. Make the choice to think about it. In Philippians 4, 8, it says, whatever is true, we just went over that, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So we can choose how we want to think about certain things. We can choose to think the worst about a situation or the best about a situation. Either the glass is half full or half empty in your life. But you get to make that choice. You get to choose. We get to cho choose what we're going to focus our minds on. All right? And this is daily. Every minute of every day, we get to choose. Is there going to be distractions that keep us from this focus? Absolutely. But we need to mentally take captive those thoughts as well. We can do that. We can take captive those thoughts. 2 Corinthians 10.5. Paul says, We demolish arguments and every pre pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So we can do that. We can take those thoughts captive. Do any of you think about things sometimes that you really don't want to think about? Yes. So stop. Okay? Stop doing it. It's like when the little kid touches the stove. Wow, that burns. Well, don't do it anymore. Okay. All right. Stop doing it. All right. So one thing that's most necessary to keep Christ at the center of our heart and mind is to guard our hearts. And that's an intentional choice that we make also, to guard our hearts. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life, your heart. What's in your heart will determine the course of your life. You are getting that, right? And he says to guard it. Who's supposed to guard it? You are. You are. Okay? We can only do this with God's help, with the help of Christ. He's the one that makes us alive. But when we follow him and follow his ways, we're guarding our own heart. All right? That makes sense? Colossians 2.12 says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So in summary, Christ is the center of everything that we are. Everything relates to the way we think about things. He is our all in all. You've heard me say that over and over before. Christ, God, is our all in all. Everything. Everything that our thoughts, our hearts, our mind, it's the core of who we are in him. He's the center of everything that we are. Amen. All right. Well, I've talked enough. Let's pray. Lord God, I... I pray that you would impress these things upon our hearts, upon our minds, Lord. Help us to know who we are in you, Lord. It's so important, Lord. It changes the course of our life to know who we are in you. Lord, you are our everything, our all in all. You are our creator, Lord. You are our sustainer, Lord. Everything that we are is wrapped up in who you are, Lord God. Help us to know that daily, minute by minute. Lord, help us to walk in that truth. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.